Good evening, everybody. Good evening, and welcome to Briz Science, Brisbane's free public lecture series on science, presented by the University of Queensland, where we aim to bring not just the best scientists, but also the best communicators to share and discuss their research with us all here in Brisbane. I'm your MC for this evening, Joel Gilmore. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respect to elders, both past and present. And I also want to acknowledge the ongoing efforts to protect and promote Indigenous and Torres Strait Islander culture uh, that leaves a lasting legacy for all Australians. Tonight, we are going to have a... I'm going to introduce our speakers in a moment because we have two speakers tonight. It's very special, Briz Science. A couple of bits of housekeeping first. We will be having, as I said, two presentations, and then we'll be taking questions at the end of both talks. So you can ask your questions either by writing them down on one of these convenient question slips you would have picked up on the way in, and we'll collect those after the talks, or on Twitter. So you can now turn your phone on, but on silent. And we will be live tweeting throughout the talk, and you can ask questions, hashtag Briz Science, and we'll get through as many of those as we can at the end of the talk. Afterwards, we'd love for you to join us outside for refreshments and the chance to have some further one-on-one -on -one chats with our speakers. I think that's all the housekeeping for now. Oh, and of course, don't forget, um, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook and all those things, so make sure you post about how great the talk was, share it with your friends, invite them along next time, you know, all those sort of things. Wonderful. So tonight, I said we have two speakers, and they are going to be talking about saving the world with the help of a very special superhero, or I should accurately say several bajillion superheroes in the form of algae. And there are a lot of problems that we need to solve, growing energy use, growing population, growing food requirements. And so we're going to talk tonight about how algae might help us provide a solution to at least some of those problems. So our first speaker tonight is Professor Ben Hankema from the University of Queensland Institute for Molecular Bioscience. And he is the founding director of both the Biofuels Consortium and the Centre for Solar Biotechnology that now has more than 30 international collaborators, collaborating centres around the world. And his research is into solar biotechnologies, using algae for everything from food to fuel. So to kick us off tonight, could you please put your hands together and welcome Professor Ben Hankema. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here, and I just want to thank Bruce Science for giving me the opportunity to present the work that we do in the Centre for Solar Biotechnology. It's been a difficult few years, and it's been a difficult few years, especially around the climate science space. And I want to show you some of the work that we've been doing to try to address some of those issues. So our focus really is on the design of next generation solar biotechnologies. And so we've brought together 30 international teams across the EU, Asia, US, Australia, New Zealand. And we have team leaders and industry partners who have experience in biology and engineering and in a whole range of economic and policy tools that we require. So microalgae, Microalgae are single-celled green organisms. You can see them here on some of those pictures that I've put up. And basically, you can consider them to be solar-driven cell factories. So they catch sunlight, they absorb CO2, they take up nutrients from the water, and they generate biomass, much like plants do, crop plants. In so doing, they release oxygen into the atmosphere, and that maintains our atmospheric oxygen levels. And the biomass that you get can be used for a whole range of products, which are shown up here. So we have high value products that we can make a whole range of them. Proteins, which we can make, especially like vaccines in algae, that kind of thing. We can make food, a whole range of chemical feedstocks, fuel, and use them for bioremediation, like water treatment. And so one of the special things about this is you may have remembered about fuels and biofuels like corn ethanol, where you have a competition between arable land for food and fuel. Well, we can produce these on non-arable land. You can produce them in salt water and you can produce them in the oceans and aquatic systems. And you can use them to drive a whole range of solar industries. So a brief history of energy. If you look back over the last uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of years, Humans did not use a great deal of energy until about the 1850s 
when we started seeing the energy use spike due to the Industrial Revolution. And if you look then also, you see that we had an increase in population. We built the infrastructure to support that population. We built industries around that and modern agriculture to support the population that now exists. All of this supports our modern way of life. And as a result of this, our global economy has now grown to $127 trillion a year. And our energy sector is a $6 trillion industry. Now, what many of us don't realize is that when you start looking at that, 80% of that energy that we use in our economy comes from fuel. So while we're really happy about what's happening about photovoltaics and putting those on the roof and seeing large-scale photovoltaic systems grow, be built up, we don't have any solutions for fuel, or very few, and this is a major issue. I would add that there are now solutions coming on board like photovoltaic systems for hydrogen generation, and we can discuss that during the question time. But algae can also be used for the production of fuel, but also to produce solar-powered industries. The first thing you need if you're going to develop a solar-powered future is to make sure you have a large enough energy supply. We've got fossil fuels and we've got them in abundance for the next few hundred years. But when you actually start looking at global energy demand, that is shown by that little red square and it's a number called 0.5 zettajoules of energy. In comparison, that green square there which is 2,600 times bigger than that and that's the solar energy that we get that we can use or plants can use for photosynthesis. So we have a huge amount of solar energy and you can consider it a fairly democratic energy source. It's spread relatively well across the world. People have access to it and they can use it for whatever they want. So, so we're show. really excited that we've, we've opened the Solar Biofuels Research Centre. It is one of the most advanced plants for microalgae production in Australia. And what we've tried to put together is an excellent team and excellent equipment to do high quality research. The reason we started off this project was that uh, we are now 7 billion people approximately and we're moving to 9 billion people. And all of us will require more food and more fuel, more chemical feedstocks and fresh water. And so what this project is about is taking algae, take sunlight and CO2 and combine it to make biomass, so the, the, the product that we make from the algae. And from this you can extract oils for the production of aviation fuels or biodiesel. You can take the biomass and you can convert that into uh, methane through fermentation. In some cases you can extract the carbohydrates for ethanol production or we also have strains which uh, convert water to hydrogen using sunlight. The most fundamental thing is improving the biomass productivity and that's what this project is about, is how do we maximize the light energy that we get in here into chemical energy in the form of biomass. So that shows you what some of those systems look like and uh, what we have to do is optimize them. So once you have the biomass, you can make a whole range of different products from it. And so within the center, we built up a series of programs around different products. So you can use algae for aquaculture feeds and for livestock feeds. You can use them as functional foods for the production of proteins, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, unsaturated fatty acids, antioxidants, and a whole range of other products. You can extract polymers from them to make bioplastics or nanomaterials. You can use them as a way of producing uh, protein therapeutics. We can use them to clean water by absorbing the nutrients out of the water and we can use them to drive the production of green biochemicals, a whole range of fine chemicals which otherwise would be made from oil. There's a range of different marine algae which you can use for herbicides and antibiotics and antiparasitics. And then the question is, where are you going to produce them? How do we start scaling these systems up? And so we have a project called the Integrated Bioeconomy Project, which is looking at next generation greenhouse systems for their production, particularly for the high value products. And then thinking about projects like the Green Smart Cities program or the Growing Roads program about how do we start putting these systems and structures into the mega cities of the future. All of these programs are now generating industry contacts and connections and so we're building teams of researchers and industry into these programs to try and address these issues. 
But it's a complex issue and it's a multi-scale issue. So I'm going to show you another little video here which goes from the global scale down to the atomic level to show you the kind of complexity that we have to try and pull together. So at the global level, you have to start understanding where the most sunshine is. What are the, uh, the best locations for production? What about policies at national levels? Is our policy better than that in China or the US, for example? Then at the local level, you have to start thinking about what the regional policies are like. You have to think about uh, what systems are best for the particular product you want to make and where you're trying to make it. And so here we're zooming into that pilot plant that you just saw in the previous movie. At the pilot plant, we have to then start thinking about what kinds of systems are best for a particular product, tubular systems or flat panels or open ponds. And then when you start going into the culture, you have to think about how you're going to maintain a uniform, clean culture for what you're trying to make and how you maximize the productivity while keeping the system as cheap as possible. Zooming in with the optical microscope, you can look at the population dynamics and cell organization. And then you have to go to the electron microscope where you start zooming into the ultrastructure of the cell. Here you can start seeing how the cells are organized and zooming through that cell, you can see different membranes and structures. And to segment them out, we developed edge detection software so you can then visualize that architecture in 3D, which you can see here. And understanding this architecture in 3D gives you the opportunity for structure-guided design of next-generation systems. You can see here different uh, parts of the cell in blue and yellow and red. The red parts are the photosynthetic uh, membranes where the light capture process takes place. And so we can zoom into those membranes and start seeing how they're organized. Why are they organized that way? How are they organized that way? What effect does that have on light capture efficiency? What can we do to change that? So here you can see these membranes. These are the thylakoid membranes here. And we can zoom into one of these membranes and you see individual proteins in these membranes. And now we can populate those with the structures of atomic structures of individual membrane proteins, which are the nanomachinery which drives this process. We're starting to understand now how they're organized in 3D. And we can solubilize those proteins out using detergent and using novel electron microscope technology, we can solve the atomic structure of these proteins. So now at the atomic level, we can start seeing how they work. And again, using modern genetic engineering techniques, we can engineer them to do things that we would like them to do. So I hope that gives you an idea about the complexity involved in the multi-scale process. So going to fuels as one of those examples, we can use algae for the production of a range of fuels. We mentioned it before, methane, diesel, petrol, ethanol, and hydrogen amongst others. And there are a multitude of different systems out there. And so the first thing that you have to do is trying to understand which of these is the best system and how can we make them better? So I'll just let that run through just to give you an idea about the concepts that people have thought about to try and optimize light delivery into those bioreactors. Then you have to think about how do I couple that into the process for making fuel? And so we developed a techno-economic and life cycle model which models the cost benefit of systems and, and their advantages. So we've got a strains database of different algae. We have uh, different production systems that we can model in and different downstream processing and harvesting techniques. And some of those will never work and some of them will work. And I did, the process then analyzes these best combinations to make processes for production. And taking this approach, we can do the analysis of products right from the high value nutraceuticals right down to fuels and biofertilizers. And that way we can start analyzing the best opportunities. So 10 years of work is summarized in this slide. This is showing you modeling of 500 hectare facilities in 12 locations in the world. In green, you can see how much biomass you can make per day. In yellow, you can see the biodiesel productivity that you get. In red, you can see the profitability of the system. If you were to produce diesel at $2 a litre, but none of us would pay it, the price for conscience is about one cent a litre. However, if you take a public utility model in which you basically say, like an electricity utility or a water utility, we don't need to make profit, we just need to make fuels that are cost competitive. 
You can achieve this for a dollar a litre in four of these locations using current technologies based on our modelling tools. This is a massive big deal because being able to do this cost competitively allows you to start breaking into the market. Co-production of other products will improve this further. So what it tells us is that fuels can be produced cost competitively using algae, if our model is correct, and I have no reason to think it's not. And we also can measure that we would only require under 0.2% of the surface area of the Earth to provide all our aviation fuel, shipping, and um, diesel fuels that we require. That's about 10% of agriculture. So this is also a very doable thing. Let's look at water. So we can use algae for treating water from agricultural runoff water. We can use it to treat industrial and municipal water. And we can use it to protect against runoff to the Great Barrier Reef, which, as we know, is undergoing no end of suffering through the global climate change that we're seeing. So the federal government has stated that they want to see a 50% reduction in sediment runoff, and they want to have an 80% reduction in nitrogen runoff from the fertilizers in fields. So if you see a sugarcane field like this, you could take that runoff, put it through an algae system to extract the nutrients and release the clean water into the environment. What you can also do is produce cyanobacteria, which are related to microalgae, and they fix nitrogen from the atmosphere. And so you actually have the ability to produce organic fertilizers and reduce the chemical fertilizer input that you would otherwise require. And collectively, then, you can improve your field production, reduce fertilizer input, and also provide a more clean barrier reef environment. As we try and drive our costs down, we look into a range of products. And the cell walls of algae are made of very complex polymers. And those polymers have unique properties. So we can extract those, and we can also use the other metabolites of the cell to make a range of bioplastics and nanocomposites and materials, which can be used for a whole range of products from a bioplastics through to cosmetics, for example, or uh, fibers. The protein therapeutic work, here if you can imagine putting in a gene to make a vaccine, for example, and expressing that, producing that protein in algae. So you can basically have an algae tablet. You can use that for aquaculture feeds, you can use it for human use. And alternatively, if it's not effective as an oral vaccine, you can purify it. So as we say, for vaccines, it can be used for novel antibiotics and a whole range of protein therapeutics. And the IMB, where I work, is a particular strength in that area, so there's some very exciting opportunities. I don't want you to look at that picture in detail. That is the, bio, the sort of photosynthetic pathway. What I want you to know is it generates protons and electrons. And in our green chemistry program, those protons and electrons can be channeled into light-driven chemistry. So we can convert compound A to compound B. And the value of that is that compound B can be orders of magnitude more valuable than compound A. And so here you open up the opportunity to develop high-value processes for green biochemistry that is light-driven. The Integrated Bioeconomy Project. Here we're focused on looking at next-generation greenhouse systems that can produce 10 times more food with 10 times less water than the agricultural uh, systems that we use today. Also, they're designed to try and provide stable temperature and humidity so that we can grow different crops within these greenhouse environments and to develop more circular processes so that we recycle any waste and minimize waste and negative impacts on the environment. All of these things have good improvements for the economy as well. Here's an earlier example from Sundrop. And here what they've got is they have a solar array which funnels the, electron, uh, the uh, solar energy up to a point to distill seawater. The seawater is used in greenhouses to produce tomatoes, and the waste wastewater is run off into these uh, ponds here. What we'd like to do with the Integrated Bioeconomy Project is to look at different materials for those greenhouses, whether we can use infrared reflective materials in the uh, photovoltaic systems that we put on the surface to take the heat load off the greenhouse, 3D production systems, different methods for carbon CO2 extraction from the atmosphere for production, automation, looking at different crops and algae products that you can make to optimize your business model, heat exchanges to stabilize the temperature, 
uh, microbiome technology where you improve the, uh, the productivity of the plants and water purification technologies. All of these are being analyzed through our techno-economic and life cycle models to see which can be best combined to develop the systems of the future. Finally then, as we go into the, the uh, more visionary projects, I guess, of the future, the Green Smart Cities program and growing roads, this is about how we can make the infrastructure of the future in our mega cities. And the Green Smart Cities can be looking at systems around buildings and the environment. The Growing Roads program is more about if you need a sound barrier and you have to pay for it anyway, can you make it a growing system and to improve our, improve our, our cityscapes? And we plan to start that now with uh, the architecture school at UQ. We have now a group of architects who are designing art and prototype systems for scale up and putting into, into our urban environments and testing how they work and how we can optimize those systems. Here's an example from Singapore who have built these super trees. Many of you may know them, but they've built these steel structures here which are significantly taller than the surrounding trees, planted up with plants. What about doing that in Brisbane but putting algae systems around them? You can start thinking about the infrastructure and bridges or again structures that fit into the cityscape like this. So why is that important? We heard before the fact that our population is rising from 7.6 to 9.8 billion people. By 2050, we will need 70% more food than we did in 2005. We will need 50% more water. We will need 50% more fuel. And we have to reduce our CO2 emissions by 100% by 2050. These challenges are massive. I'm not going to labor this point, but I like this climate sp spiral. Many of you have seen it, that if you look at climate change from take the baseline at 1850. That was our zero degree climate change point. By around 1950, we were at about 0.5. By 2000, we were at one degree. By 2020, we're looking at 1.5. By 2025, it's more like two. And as we move forward, we hit 2050, three. 2075, four. And 2100, five. So according to the IPCC, that's our safe limit. That's where we are now. That's why we don't have any time and that's why we need to do this and we need your engagement and support. Just switching off CO2 is not gonna be enough. Europe alone uses twice the resources that we need for the planet every year. And um, that's not sustainable. So if you imagine a linear process that we've been using where we've been digging stuff out of the ground, using it and putting the waste out, that's a linear process. We have to cycle everything. And so the EU in particular are pushing a circular economy principle where you build processes in which things are recycled. And algae fit very well into that. They do pretty much the opposite of what humans do. We release CO2, they absorb it. We need oxygen, they produce it, etc. And so they are a perfect complement to trying to deal with some of the planetary boundaries that we are facing and that we are exceeding. This graph here from the Stockholm Resilience Center shows some of those planetary boundaries that we are exceeding, which include climate change, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we have in particular also biogeochemical flows, i.e. nitrogen and phosphate release into the environment. And the biosphere integrity is a, another major issue. So it turns out that I heard just recently that apparently one million of the eight million species on the planet are in danger. And so that's why these kinds of technologies are really crucial. So I wanna thank our many industry partners who have supported us over the years. We're getting many more joining us. We've had about another nine industry partners join us this year, which is wonderful. And I wanna thank my team. A couple of people in particular, uh, Ian Ross, who does a lot of the work on the uh, the design of new systems, Juliana Wolf, who operates a lot of the systems at the pilot plant. Jennifer Yarnell did a lot of the modeling work together with John. Evan is our pilot plant manager and Zenat was make, working on the biofertilizers. Recombinant protein work was also done by Saskia and Mel, who's not on this picture. And to all of them, I wanna say thank you, together with my co-directors who helped me run the center. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ben. Thought-provoking and hopefully inspiring. Um, 
our next speaker continuing on our algae story is Professor Pia Sheng from the University of Queensland, who is in the School of Agriculture and Food Sciences. And he heads laboratories in both algae biotechnology and the plant microbe interactions. So could you please welcome our second speaker, Professor Pia Sheng. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Joel, for the invitation. I think it's a great honor for me to speak about something that I'm very passionate about. So I share this passion with Ben about algae. And I uh, also brought some with me, so I'm going to share these with you. This is our latest product called Algae Caviar. So I'm going to just pass this around. OK. Yep. Um, so yeah, so we're basically looking at algae for food, feed, and fuel. So I'd like to see how we can actually convert this into a reality. You know, it sounds really good to algae should be our future, but how come we don't see algae everywhere already if they are so good, you know? So it looks like we have to do some extra work to build up this industry to really make it reality. So because algae are not yet part of our everyday life, so what is missing? So we're going to have a look at some of the constraints and what we can do to bring that to the next level. So we're looking at just focusing on algae for food, feed, and fuel, so the three Fs, food, feed, and fuel, but with that, you already are looking at three of the main components of our society. The biggest economy is really looking at, you know, if you look at food, that's very important for us. If you look at feed, very important for the animals, so also important for us is food and fuel, which is, as Ben said, 80% currently of our energy use. So very important to produce that sustainably and to cover the future demands. Um, so if we look at microalgae, I think Ben summarized this very nicely already. So they, are, they have a very high area productivity, so much higher than plants, because they don't have to make a stem first, flower, and then produce some fruit. They simply double or triple in just a single day. So just imagine you had a plant that's about this size, and uh, you go to bed the next morning, you look at it, it's this big. You know? So that's what algae do. They double or triple in just a single day, so they're super productive little beasts. Um, they also don't need to use arable land, so we don't need to compete with current food production or biodiverse landscapes, because basically they can grow on ponds. And best of all, they can use almost any type of water. That includes brackish water, seawater. You may know that about 11% of Australia is contaminated by salinity, so it's unsuitable to grow crops, but it would be suitable to grow algae. So we can do also this climate is suitable for all year round harvesting, and we can have many valuable byproducts, so not just, for example, fuel, but we can look at high value products, for example, omega-3 rich fatty acids, which currently come from fish. But the fish only have the fatty acids, the omega-3 fatty acids, because they eventually eat smaller fish, they eat zooplankton, and they eat algae. So why not cut out the middle fish and directly produce the omega-3 on land with the algae? So you don't have to get any fish uh, involved. Um, so to make this reality, we need to look at the learning curve. Like any new technology, it requires a learning curve. If you think about solar technology, how long it took to actually become reality, we need to also allow a little bit of time for the industry to learn the tricks and to make it more efficient and cheaper. But in reality, algae only need sunshine, flat land, almost any type of flat land, and water in almost any type of water. So that looks very good. Um, so if we do um, a bit of a modeling, and uh, Diego is one of my students who's done the modeling. He's actually sitting there in the audience, so you might interview him as well. Do you want to raise your hand, Diego? Just so that's him there. Okay, so he's done modeling of the whole world, and basically he looked at suitability based on resource availability and profitability. So he's looking at where can we grow algae sustainably without competing for arable land or biodiversity areas, high biodiversity areas. So if you look at Australia, that looks pretty good. So we have all of this area here and this area as well where we can grow algae, and the Middle East also looks very good if, that, if you look at that. Um, so we've set up a team, the algae biotechnology team, and you can see these are all kinds of different people. They're all super nice people. You're welcome to visit me and meet them in person. And, um, but they come from different walks of life, not just biologists, not just people who are interested in genetics, but a lot of engineers now, a lot of people interested in ec economics and uh, chemistry as well. So we come across all kinds of different people because it's setting up a whole new industry. It's not just the biology of the algae that's required here. Um, so initially, you may walk to a nice beach and collect some algae. 
So this is the, it's a Sunshine Coast calendar. You may recognize King's Beach. That's um, just from rock pools. These are some fantastic algae that you can collect there. We have a look whether they grow really fast, whether they're high in oil. So the idea being, if you produce a lot of oil, you can maybe use that oil for fuel, such as biodiesel. Right? And so high in oil production. And then also we have to find a way how to harvest them. Because one of the difficulties with algae, because they're so microscopic and they're in water, is how to get them out. You can't just filter them out. That will block the filter very, very quickly. So ideally, you can do a process called induced settling, where you simply let the algae settle to the ground and then remove 95% of the water, recycle the water. So this is how you can remove the algae from the water. That's the best situation if we can have algae that sink naturally. Then, of course, we need to test them in bioreactors, open ponds. We need to look at harvesting extraction processes, and then we're looking at an algae biorefinery, where it's not just one product. For example, oil, okay, that can be used for biodiesel, biofuel, that's great. That's only 30% of the biomass. If you look at the yellow droplets are the oil. The remaining biomass is very interesting still because it's high in protein, antioxidants, carotenoids, vitamins, minerals, etc and especially protein with all essential amino acids. So it's super valuable in terms of a whole food as well. <clears throat> so maybe we can produce some oil for fuel and then maybe some high value products to make it a feasible enterprise. For example, those omega-3 fatty acids that I talked about. And then we can also look at using the biomass maybe uh, for um, human consumption or animal feed. Um, so we've taken a few steps to make this whole process more economical. So the last 10 years, I've basically dedicated to making sure that every step is more optimized so that we can make it a reality. So really reducing the cost of production was the main aim. So step one was finding a high lipid, high oil producing algae strain. And you can see here, I really like these algae. These are called tetraselmis. They come from Oruchidor. A student went out there, collected a sample. and. Um, kind of nice because they have a red eye spot. So when you look at them in the microscope, you develop a bit of a personal relationship to them. They, they basically look back at you, so get some feedback, which is always nice. And, uh, and then in reward to that kind of personal relationship you develop, they produce lots of oil. You can see these are chocoblock full of oil droplets here. So fantastic, ready to harvest. Um, Another thing that we worked a lot on is the shape of the pond that we grow the algae in. So, for example, you need to do, after some hydrodynamic modeling, you are able to reduce turbulences in the pond as the water circulates around, and also the way we can um, aerate the system. So we've developed a horizontal airlift, which is something the engineers thought is not possible. We just didn't believe them, and we proved them wrong. So we're very happy to have a horizontal airlift, because normally air bubbles vertically, right? So it's a bit counterintuitive, but it, it's able to do this work and um, create a really healthy culture. Another step, how can we synchronize that all the algae produce oil all at the same time so we can harvest them all at the same time? So we're doing this here by nutrient starvation. <coughs> so when they run out of nutrients, do you know you have an algae bloom in your pool if there's too many nutrients, right? And also in some other areas, coastal areas. So you get an algae bloom. That's a big problem normally. However, um, when they run out of nutrients, they, uh, they stop dividing and there's no more algae bloom, but they can still do photosynthesis. And as Ben was pointing out, the products of photosynthesis, when, when you fix carbon dioxide and water, it makes glucose. And um, we all know what happens if, when we eat too much sugar, right? Basically, we become fat. Same with the algae. So they still do photosynthesis. Even though they have no more nutrients, they can still do photosynthesis, and they're all fattened up at the same time. Within a day or two, we can harvest them ready for oil extraction. <coughs> so we found also another technique, which is basically adding a bit of UV light, extra sunshine, if you like, and we can double the um, amount of oil that they produce. <coughs> Here we, we have also developed another step, which now doesn't, um, we don't need to dry the algae anymore. That was a big problem, having to dry the algae and then extract the oil. So rather than having to dry the algae, we developed a step called wet oil extraction. So the, um, in this case, we basically can only do it to some algae because some algae have a very fragile cell wall. So we can explode that cell wall. It's a bit brutal. Sorry, I'm just going back. We can explode the cell wall um, with uh, osmotic shock, for example. <coughs> and then as a result, those lipid bodies come out, the lipid droplets come out. We can already remove most of the oil in the first step 
and then there's a secondary um, step where we can remove the second uh, step, uh, second parts of the oil. Um, so then we have another problem, which is basically we have formed an emulsion. So these oil droplets just don't sur don't add up at the surface, but they form an emulsion a bit like milk. So now we have to challenge how to remove those little lipid droplets out of the liquid. Uh, luckily, one of my students serendipitously discovered a new type of filter, this hydrogel, and the hydrogel is able to separate oil from water, so you can get oil recovery. We also found that the same filter is able to remove microbes, even viruses, from water, and we're now working with SEQ Water and implementing this for uh, water purification for Brisbane water. So very happy to, to do that work as well on this side. Um, so next step was for us, okay, we need to have a learning curve. So with that comes the economy of scale. We should be able to develop things cheaper as we do them on larger scale. So um, we built an algae farm. Uh, this is the first steps of the algae farm about five years ago, getting industry ready. And so we, uh, this is in Pinjara Hills, just up in the river. And you can see we're building these kind of raceway ponds here. So you can see that from Google Earth. Basically, it's just next to the river. So this place is completely remote from any civilization, if you like. It's, it only has no town water. It has no electricity. So it really just uses the sunshine and the water that's available there. Um, so using the river water and the sunshine that's available as well. So proving a point. So this UQ algae energy farm um, then starts with small cultures that come from the lab and then goes to larger cultures. This is 4,000 liters. And that serves then as inoculum for the 40,000 liter ponds. And then the 40,000 liter ponds, there's three of them that can be grown and that serves as inoculum for an even bigger pond that I'll show you a photo later. Um, and then the harvesting can be done in a V-shaped pond where the 60,000 liters just simply settle. 95% of the water is recycled. If we need to dry, we have a solar dryer as well that can be used. So all steps have been integrated. Now looking at the biorefinery, so this is where the costs come in. Well, how, much, how can we make a profit out of growing algae? Because I believe only when you can make a profit out of this technology, Companies come on board and they help you really implement and deploy the technology in the real world. So we need to do that. So working with a company here, with two companies in fact, Cuponics and Woods, we're looking at an algae biorefinery. This particular algae called Nanocoropsis, and it's also the one I'm passing around by the way, uh, produces a lot of these omega-3 fatty acids. So it's high in EPA. So the omega-3 rich oil is is super profitable because you can get about $150 a liter for this oil. So it's the same process so that we need for biofuel production. So we, we basically have this and then we remaining, the remaining biomass is very high in protein. So we have this protein rich defatted biomass which has almost a neutral taste. So it's very good to blend with other food because it's um, potentially non-allergenic, so there's no known allergies against this kind of protein. And so the food companies are super interested in finding protein that's non-allergenic that they can add to food. And as you know, protein is the big thing these days if you look at healthy um, living. <clears throat> so if we look at the costs, so similar in my cost model that what uh, Ben has found, we, these are the actual costs of production at the farm. And if you look at the costs, so the biggest expense is actually the addition of CO2. So it costs us $2.70, including amortization of capital expenses per kilogram of algae dry weight to produce. Uh, 145 of that though is just CO2. So if we can find a free CO2 source, is basically the conclusion from this, we can make the production much cheaper. So we would be able to produce um, oil for less than a dollar a liter if we have free CO2 source. And so where can free CO2 source come from? Gas power plants, uh, breweries, for example, but also anaerobic digesters, right? Or, or ethanol, bioethanol production units. So we would be able to do this economically if we get some free CO2, okay? So then we can have a look at what kind of um, extra value, high value products we can produce. So also looking at an income stream from high value products to make it really attractive for industry. So if we look at omega-3, I already mentioned that the global fish stocks are declining. We're now down to 10% of the original fish stocks, so it's very alarming. 
but the microalgae are the primary producers of omega-3, so we should really eat algae rather than fish oil if we can do that. And so we had a look which algae are the highest ones and then grow these algae at, um, at a higher rate. We also can get nice carotenoids from algae. And uh, something that's not so well known is phytosterols. So phytosterols lower cholesterol levels. And you can even buy wheat bix with phytosterols in them from soybean. But it turns out that one particular microalgae, this one is called Paflova luthri, and it's my favorite algae because it produces omega-3 carotenoids and has up to 5% of its dry weight and phytosterol. So a fantastic algae, and I can only recommend it. Unfortunately, not yet approved as food. So we're working on that. But uh, they use it in aquaculture, so it's, it's already. So what is approved as food? So nanocrops is one of the algae that is used, approved as food in some countries. So we now had a lot of food technology students developing new kind of food. And I just want to share with you what you think about this kind of food. I started with algae bread. So you basically just put a bit of algae when you make the bread. Um, and then consumer perception, that's really just my lab, who used, uh, I used them as guinea pigs. And so this is what they had to say. People who didn't eat the bread because they thought, oh, it looks disgusting, it's too green, it already looks moldy. But the people who ate the bread, they seem, seem tastier, it's really good with cheese, they can smell the algae flavor, and they would eat it again. In fact, for about half a year, every week, we had this um, at the lab meeting, and people are still healthy. So, so, surprisingly. Other students then came up with things like uh, colorful pasta. So you can make colorful pasta by just adding different types of algae. Spirulina is well known, that gives a bit of a blue color. So the blue color in Smarties, for example, comes from spirulina. So you can do uh, blue, um, algae, uh, blue pasta, sorry. You can do green ones, and you can do red one with hematococcus, and even orange one with dunanella. Just some examples there. Um, I've taken this to a bit of a next level, so I actually went to Hong Kong at a food conference there, and I uh, pretended I was a cook. I've never been in a master chef kitchen before, but I tried my luck uh, doing some algae, and so this is my attempt to make algae um, or pasta, and uh, you can see I already found a friend who was a big fan, and it's great. He, by the way, this guy invented 60 years ago the first computer, is what he was telling me, so very interesting, I think. So there's a company now doing this kind of work. It's called Hess Algae. This company is uh, founded in Brisbane, uh, but it's got a subsidiary in Hong Kong looking at the Asian market to basically get the food out there that is enriched with algae for improved nutritional purposes. Um, also in the same series from Hess Algae is the, are these golden nugget biscuits. Um, I kind of like them, and they're a bit savory, so I don't know if we call them biscuits or whether they should be called muffins or something. We're still looking at a good marketing strategy. And these ones are my favorite because these protein balls, you only need to eat three of them, actually one of these, to cover your omega-3 requirement, daily requirement. We can put up to 20% of, this, the, of the, the protein ball can be algae without affecting the taste too much because there's a lot of cocoa in there and that masks the taste of algae. Uh, which is not too bad, but some people may not like the algae flavor too much. So this one I can really highly recommend if you want to have some nice protein and omega-3 at the same time. And it tastes good. Um, now this one is algae caviar, so what I'm passing around. So it's really about packaging. Algae is kind of have this reputation of being yucky and slimy. So how can we make them more interesting and, and make them look nicer? So uh, this is the making of algae caveats. So we basically put some alginate encapsulation, and this is how we make them. So it's a bit of a beautiful process, right? So <laughs> okay. Basically, it's just a drop of algae falling into a liquid, and then they solidify, making an alginate capsule. So it looks pretty nice, and that's what I'm passing around as well. Um, so as a result, you have these beautiful looking algae caviar. And so there's a company now we uh, just formed recently at the Sunshine Coast and Ocean Orchards. And Anna, who had originally actually been invited to give this talk, also is, is now in Europe. So she's not actually talking about directly, but this is basically the product that they have. They're just, just at the Sunshine Coast growing these algae caviar and selling them at the local markets. And hopefully we'll see them in Brisbane very soon. So. Coming back to where we can grow algae, so if we really want to look at the master plan, which is to grow fuel and feed and all these kind of big ticket items to address food and energy security, we need to look where we can grow algae sustainably. 
And so, uh, and then we need to implement and establish the industry. So really the next step, I think, is to establish the large scale production of microalgae. And uh, we can do that with, of course, the corporate sector. So we're looking at building very large algae farms. So the first one we helped build was in Oman with a Japanese company. Um, so that's nicely in the area that's recommended to grow algae. So the, here, this shows the principle that basically you can grow algae on non-arable land in the desert. This is with salt water in the desert, and yeah, you can grow algae there. So it's fantastic, proving the point. Um, this one is, again, in Penjara Hills. So we upgraded the site, and I just want to show you this is the new pond. Ben, you probably haven't seen that yet, but it's a new pond, which is 200,000 liters, and it's... Um, and this is with the company Cuponics, and we're going to produce nanocropsis for omega-3 in Pinjara Hills. You can see the Brisbane River just in the background there. So we're using the river water directly. We have a lot of solar panels here. This is 28 kilowatt uh, solar panels, and we have 50 kilowatt of um, battery power there to make this all happen. So at the energy farm, basically, we have these different ponds and, and reactors. And we try to also produce already commercially with this company that we're looking at and doing research at the same time. So it's a kind of UQ doing a little bit of research, but also doing, uh, working with the corporate sector to establish the technology. Another large farm that we just established is in Gondiwindi. So with the industry partner Woods Group, Woods is producing grain, but also a lot of feed, animal feed. So, and um, the, the videos should be play, playing soon, should be playing soon, but these are the largest ponds by far. You can see on the right, yeah, you can see how they just basically pedal wheels. Okay. So this is in Gondi Windy. There was a little bit of protest from the neighbors initially because there's gonna, they thought there was going to be lots of mosquitoes and so on, but we could assure them that that's not going to be the case, and they're also not um, producing a lot of odor or anything like that. So each one of these ponds is 250 meters long and uh, 16 meters wide, so one acre ponds. That's the full-size pond now. Another one is near Miles. So this is another company, again, Austrian Pure Australia. So they have already a bioreactor and they have a covered pond, as you can see here. What's interesting with them is that they're close to a gas power station. This is near Miles. Miles is just here. So this gas power station produces a lot of clean, clean CO2, which could be used to make the algae production much cheaper. And we also happen to have coal seam gas water here. So we've done some trials with coal seam gas water there, and we can also grow some algae in the coal seam gas water, therefore making use of the water, which otherwise would just be sitting there. Um, and, and then there's few algae farms that are under construction in the moment. So one of them is near Balina. They're waiting for the permit to grow this. And then another one is near Mowillumba, northern New South Wales. And uh, they all have plans for 10 hectare algae farms. So um, just want to share one principle with you. It's possible to just grow fuel without any input other than sunshine. I'm just saying that. So basically, we're looking at a solar power plant that rather than electricity produces now oil. And it's possible. So we've showed that it can be done. So inputs are, oh, sorry, just go back. The inputs are the sunshine and a little bit of CO2 from the air. You need to top up water for, to account for evaporation. Basically, you grow some algae in the algae pond, you put some nutrients in there first, then you, have, you harvest the concentrated algae, you do some oil extraction resulting in biodiesel. The remaining biomass, however, can be used for anaerobic digestion. With anaerobic digestion, you now get biogas production and some electricity, but you also get some CO2 after that burning of the biogas, which is great because you need to recycle some of the CO2 so you have better CO2 supply and faster growth of the algae. And the digestate from the anaerobic digester, the nutrients in there can be recycled. So the nutrients never leave the system. Okay, so you put the nutrients in once and you're only extracting carbon from the system. So you're putting carbon dioxide in and you're putting biodiesel and biogas out. Both of these are carbon compounds. So it is a solar power plant producing oil, and that's kind of a dream if we can make this happen economically. Um, so uh, we're proposing to do this in Gatton, at the UQ Gatton campus. So at the Gatton campus, there's an interesting situation because they are about to build a very big anaerobic digester with a new piggery. Um, and so you can see with the piggery, uh, all the effluent from the, those pigs goes into an anaerobic digester we have free CO2, we have free nutrients, we can grow algae, we can now produce biogas, electricity, biodiesel, 
But on top of that, we actually have too many nutrients because of the pigs. And so now we can also produce some protein-rich biomass, which could be used for feed, or we can also clean up the water. So taking some more boxes even if we can do this in Gatton. So that's why my plan for next year. Hopefully, we can implement that. This is just some extra things how you can do. So for example, as Ben mentioned also, we can use them as natural preservatives. We can find antibiotics in algae. And um, one other thing, we can also fix carbon, carbon and store it even. Uh, but that's another story. I can talk about that later if you like. So in summary, um, yeah, you can be part of the Algae for Food Feed and Fuel with Ben and myself. If you're interested, please contact us. There's, uh, my website is shanklab.com. Um, but I think we can address the big issues such as human, human health, biodiversity decline, food security, energy security by uh, looking at algae and supporting algae. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Um, we might invite both of our speakers to the stage. Join me in the middle there. This is your chance now to um, ask questions. If you've got some paper there, you can write your questions down there or sign photos or whatever you have to, to submit. And we will come around and collect those. Just wave them in the air as you put them together. Next month's talk is going to be on artificial intelligence and looking at some of the technological applications that this might bring, including facial recognition. And that will be on the 8th of July. So make sure you um, head onto website, sign up to the mailing list so you get informed when tickets become available for that. Um, okay, I'm going to go to Twitter for the first questions as soon as my phone gets its act back together. That's great. Um, okay, so first question, starting off um, nice and easy. Uh, Keith asks, about 3.5 years ago, he went to the dentist and mentioned that the algae was the wheat of the sea. Um, he's not sure whether that was true, so he wants to know, is there any truth to that statement? Would you call algae the wheat of the sea? Um. I, I think I would agree, yeah. I don't know what you think, but I think I would agree. I mean, the Nanocropsis algae, for example, they could be called a weed because they grow super fast. So, yeah, they, they are essentially a weed. They can cause algae blooms. Is that, is that what, do you think that dentist person meant? I mean, because they, they are really a weed. And, you know, one thing that we have to make sure is that no one eats them before we harvest them. <laughs> so it can be an issue. So there's about... There's about 350,000 different species out there that have been reported or people think should be there. And so I guess there's a, a diversity of algae which can have different uses. And um, I, that's such a massive diversity compared to higher plants. I think the other thing is that when we see things like toxic blooms, which I think is maybe also what people are referring to when they think of weeds, uh, that has a lot to do with the nutrients being put out in uncontrolled ways. That's where you get a bloom, you get an excess of phosphate or nitrogen. So they've got the, so they've got the ability to, uh, to grow quickly like a weed, if provided with the right environment. But if you have clean environments, they tend to be more balanced. Yeah. I mean, having so many different types of algae, the algae have been around so much longer than animals or plants. That means they're super diverse. You know, we once sequenced just two algae that look exactly the same in the microscope and found that only 10% of their genome was identical. I mean, compare that to us, we have 50% genome sharing with bananas, right? <coughs> Maybe some more than others, but you just... Show, the, <laughs> these, these two algae that look the same in the microscope, only 10% homology to each other, right? So that's how diverse they are. So, so I don't, you know, it doesn't matter almost what your question is, algae is almost always the answer because they do so many different things. So, yeah. You'd be a terrible game show contestant, but otherwise I like it. I challenge um, everyone. <laughs> okay, so we've got um, some questions, well, lots of questions rolling in. Um, we've got a couple of questions around the taste of algae. So what does algae taste like? And if it tastes bad, how do we fix that? Okay. Yep, good. Okay, uh, so different algae food. Uh, we've developed different algae food, and sometimes the taste overwhelming. Of course, different algae have different tastes. So the ones that are high in omega-3 get a bit of a fishy marine taste. All right, so the healthy ones get a bit of a marine taste. So not everyone's cup of tea. A lot of my Asian students absolutely love it, 
but uh, some of the more Western inclined cuisine people don't like it so much. So how can you cover the taste? There are some tricks. So for example, the protein balls that we have, we're able to include 20% of the algae because the cocoa powder has such an overwhelming flavor that you don't actually taste the algae anymore. If we go higher than 20%, you do taste them. So it's, there's a threshold for each type of food, how much you can get away with in including. Um, but um, you, the more the better, of course. But uh, in, in terms of the protein balls, it's fantastic because we can include 20% of their, and that means you only have to eat three of the protein balls, while, for example, the biscuits or those gold nuggets, you'd have to eat 15 right? so, per day, which may be a bit of a challenge. So, <laughs> but the other one is the algae caviar. I think that has a lot of promise because with that, we're covering some of the taste because they're encapsulated. So it's a very nice side dish. So I can recommend that. There's also the option of microencapsulation. If you do microencapsulation, you may know about the perky drink that UQ has developed. So this microencapsulation technology allows you to package almost anything um, and uh, put it into a drink, and you don't taste it at all. So that's another option. Another option is the way that you do the actual downstream processing. So if you purify out the protein, for example, you can change the taste quite significantly. And uh, in some cases, you do heating steps to do that that processing and that can also change a bit like when you cook something you get a browning effect or something like that that can change the flavors maybe you also know the the nori, nori sheets you know those seaweed things they don't taste too bad they taste actually quite good and the reason is because they put a lot of sesame oil there and salt and that covers up a lot of the taste that you normally get that would be a bit fishy or more like marine taste so little tricks like that <coughs> A follow-up question, which is, how digestible are algae for humans? I, yeah. you. I think that's probably one of those things that still hasn't been fully established. You have a lot of species which are generally regarded as safe uh, species, and you, know, you do buy algae tablets in, in, in the shop, so I guess they would probably be digestible, or at least um, partially so. Some species are, are much tougher to digest because they have really tough cell walls, and so you have to process them in some way, like cracking them to make them more accessible. Yeah, I think it's an excellent question because there's the thing about, yeah, you can eat algae, but do you actually get the nutrients out of it, right? So the, the nanocrops algae, for example, have a very tough cell wall. Um, so we're working on an artificial stomach, so there's an artificial stomach that we're using to actually find out how much is digestible, and then another question is, digestible is one thing, but another question is how much is bioavailable, how much actually ends up in your body, right? So we, we um, I'm actually participating in a trial very soon, I don't know if you do as well, but there's one that from Iwi, from the algae, so that's starting end of the month. I'm gonna eat a lot of algae oil, and they're gonna take my blood before, I've taken the algae oil and then three times during the process. So we're going to see whether that makes a difference, although there's also placebo that they're going to possibly feed me, so I'm not supposed to know what's what. Well, I can probably find out. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so, if we, so yeah, wait for the answer of that question. I think it'd be interesting to see. All right, we'll, we'll follow up with you next year, next okay. Bridge Science. All right. we'll do some blood sampling. Okay, um, next question. Um, so, Ben, or perhaps either of your question is, uh, is biodiesel completely substitutable for regular diesel? Yeah, I mean, basically, if you think about where diesel came from, uh, a lot of it was based on plant material, including algae and cyanobacteria, which was compressed over millions of years and heated. And as a result, you get a crude oil, which we extract and refine. Here, what you do is you produce the same plant material, uh, you often put it through a pressure cooker, and so instead of waiting a million years, you can do this in a few days. And then you go through an absolutely normal refining process. You come out with basically essentially uh, diesel that can be exchanged for normal diesel. Yeah. Great. I believe Virgin already had a flight with algae yeah. jet fuel, and that was quite successful, and they, they didn't find any difference at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or indeed improvements in some cases. So in some cases, they found at a higher energy density. So that meant you had to load on less fuel. Right. Um, so we've got several questions which are around like these next steps. So one of the questions is, um, can we grow our own algae at home? And Shane on Twitter asks, do you see us co converting our pools to bioreactors, like solar panels on our roofs? Uh, my, my pool might already be functioning as a fairly effective <laughs> algae. So this, when you do the modeling, Economies of scale are really important. 
And the other thing is that when you ask people what they actually want to do, like if you had to go out every day and maintain your pond, would you want to do it? I think most people probably wouldn't. So while one could potentially do this at home, I expect that what will happen is it could be, I expect we would be looking at distributed systems. And it touches on the issue about like how much do we need? Like for Australia, we would require 116 by 116 kilometers uh, to produce the, the renewable fuel that we require for the country. It sounds a lot. But when you start thinking about distributed systems around the country, you might think about having that at a town level. So you might have somebody to manage the process. And I expect that's more likely to happen because it's easier mm. to manage on that level. Yeah, I, I, it's a bit like growing vegetables, I suppose, right? You can do it and it becomes a bit of a hobby. So you can probably supplement your intake of food, but you probably wouldn't rely solely on that. Um, so you can do that too. I know quite a few people who grow their own spirulina. And that's fine, it's easy to harvest. I can, I can help you if you're interested in that. Um, if you really wanted to grow your own fuel, for example, you would need about 800 square meter of land um, to do that. So, but it would, would require a bit of work. You get a harvest every three days, roughly. So. <laughs> but it opens up a really important question about the issue about economic development and regional development. When you think about the fact that we, we have a lot of uh, how shall I say, divergence between rich and poor, and particularly in regional communities, there's a lot of anxiety about work and uh, the ability to provide meaningful jobs. Here's an opportunity to, to do that. And we've actually done calculations on this basis for Australia. So we import $35 billion of fuel every year. We have the ability to produce that here. It would provide 89,000 direct jobs. It would provide over 400,000 indirect jobs. If you compare that to the Adani mine, which is about a thousand jobs, you can see that, that there would be a lot more, sorry? If that. If that, yep. So it would be a lot more opportunity to do that. The, the cost saving to the country, the calculations that we've done, it would require about 10 years payback, which is not unreasonable. If you put a solar panel on your roof, it's about 10 year payback as well, you know, something like that. And at that point, you are then uh, generating or saving, if you like, of about $44 billion a year. And our national debt, I think, is somewhere about 400.4 uh, trillion. So, but 400, yeah, 400, 400 billion. So basically, you start seeing that you could make a significant impact on regional development, providing jobs and dealing with national debt. Yeah. So, what are the blockers then? What's stopping this from? Yeah, I'm crying. Yeah, good. good. So the, the the blockers are that it's cost. You know, if you think about this, there's, if you look at the last election, right? So regardless of what your position is in politics, climate change was touted as one of the most important issues, but that's not what people voted for in the end. In the end, it was probably around jobs. And uh, if, particularly if you look at Queensland, around the Adani mine, that was around jobs. So what people are also saying in a way is that they wanna see action on climate change, but the majority of people would like to see somebody else pay for it, i.e. the private sector rather than the public sector. So not taxes, but create a process which is economic. And I think that's the bottleneck, is how do you make it economic? So what happened in 2009 is there was a lot of investment that went into this, and a lot of companies went bust because they built the wrong systems. And it was predictable, especially when you model it, that those systems would not work. But now what we can do is our models show not only why they didn't work, but how you can make it work. And I think that's really important because it guides us in terms of doing our development efficiently. We will require something like $20 trillion of infrastructure upgrades between now and 2050 to deal with climate change. Building the wrong systems is a big expensive mistake. So if we can model these things right and drive it out, we can fast track that development and that's really good. Things that Pear's doing where he's just trying these out also really helpful. You learn really useful tricks on the way. So it's a combination of doing part at scale optimization of modeling and then testing things and see that work. But bringing it together can be efficient. So, so we, we learned actually that cost is not the only factor. I thought it was the only factor for a long time and we really tried to bring the cost lower and lower and lower. And that's true, right? Really people find it attractive, investors find it attractive. But there are some other considerations, for example, and these are like Ben mentioned, creating jobs in regional areas, uh, national security, if you don't have to import that much oil, for example, you can produce your oil, your own oil. 
that, that kind of thing, and also making a cleaner environment and more sustainable practices. That, that also is important. So there are early technology adopters who find this really attractive. They're the same kind of people who now buy an electric car. It's not for economic reasons. It's, they want to make a difference. And they're the kind of people who really drive this along. So what we need to do now is we have to find a compromise. So it's got to be some economics in there. Something's got to be worthwhile, the investors' money. So for example, at the Gatton Farm, we were looking at biofuel production. We're also going to produce high-value protein. You know, the fuel is only going to cost $1 a liter, but the protein is going to be $20 a kilogram, okay? So that's where the money comes initially. And then maybe the protein becomes less important with the learning curve, and then fuel becomes the main thing because it's a huge market, obviously. So that's, that's where we're trying to head with this, yeah. Great. So um, two more quick questions then. So one is from Nicola on Twitter who asks, what can the general public do to help make this algae economy a reality sooner? So what's the electric car equivalent, perhaps, that... So, yeah, I think that's a, that's a really good question. It's something I've been wondering around, uh, you know, thinking about a lot. And I think we have to think about alternative business models. So if you want change and you want climate change and you want to do something, there's a question whereby thinking about whether the Centre for Solar Biotechnology, different people who are working in this space, could work on crowdsource projects. So if you're interested in that, come and talk to me, I'd be really happy to talk to you about how we make that work. There's also an element whereby one has to think about the business models of the future. There may be traditional business models where you have investors doing work on, to do that, but what about crowdsource projects where people get involved to actually just get these technologies out there and thinking about whether one can integrate that with some kind of shareholder initiative. They're, they're really innovative business models that we need to think about, and social enterprises. Yeah, maybe if you're interested in being part of some of the companies that are doing this and pushing this forward, I mean, very happy to bring in contact with those. I mean, they are looking for investors, for example, and shareholders to be part of this growing economy, if you like. And then also, I think in the future, you're going to see more and more algae products, I hope anyway, like some of the food products, for example, that should be available. There's already a company, EV, producing algae oil, for example, for omega-3, so you can look at, and you know, maybe, maybe um, support these kind of algae products because that will help grow the industry and make it more profitable. And with that, the learning curve should be achieved, which will make it cheaper, just like with solar panels, you know, making that cheaper because they're produced at higher uh, quantities. Mm. Which perhaps leads to our last question, which is, what should I study so I can come and work for you? <laughs> I'm not sure which of you that was directed towards, so just well, take, it, take okay. it optimistically. The approach I usually take is I say, what's your dream project? And let's try and see if we can work around that, because yeah. there are so many skills that you require yeah. from biology to engineering, policy development. You know, one of the things that came out, you wouldn't immediately think policy is important, but as I mentioned before with the fuel utility issue, the most important factor which came out in terms of cost of systems was biomass production. The second one was tax rates and interest rates. And so that shows you the importance of policy. So it really doesn't matter where you come from. Initially, think about the dream component that you're most interested in and we can tell you whether that's an important factor or not and then you work it from there. Yeah, I, I totally agree. It doesn't really matter what you're doing because all aspects are required here. Economic, environmental, social. If you're good at engineering or economics or if you're a biologist, any of these things would be fantastic because you can see that I'm a biologist, I'm a microbiologist by trade, but I, half of my team are engineers or ec economists. So really, it, it doesn't matter where you're coming from, you, you can be part of this. Uh, we're still looking for people like, um, good people who are good with economy or people who are good with social science as well because the social acceptance is an important factor. Uh, we now have found a really good way. We're getting a lot of school classes to visit. And for example, one thing that brought the Gondivindi farm over the line against the protests that we had initially against mosquitoes was that uh, we sang, they said, oh, this is going to be a facility used for education. And everyone cares about their kids, right? Everyone does. So basically, that's an education facility, and you can get training in all sorts of different disciplines there and put it all together. Well, thank you. It is wonderful to see some inspiring and optimistic research that looks on the brink of really changing things up in Australia and globally. So thank you both for coming along for your time tonight. Please join me in thanking our speakers tonight, Pia and Ben. And make sure to join us next month and join us for some food and drink outside. Can't promise any algae, however.